difference between Christianity 1.0 and 2.0. And some of you are at 1.0 because you know you can't fight against God and win. But it, God's not after just obedience. He's after a new kind of obedience, the kind that grows where your heart delights in him and delights in what he delights in. Let's keep reading. For I knew, Jonah says, that you are a gracious God and merciful. How dare you? Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. I love this. Verse 4. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? This is basically the Lord saying, really? Jonah's disease is twofold. Number one, Jonah is an idolater. Jonah's idol is that he loves his racial identity. He loves his status as a leader in a prosperous nation. The Ninevites not being destroyed would threaten that, so he hates them because they threaten to take from him that thing which he loves most. Let me give you the second, um, the second element of Jonah's disease. Jonah's ignorant. Jonah's ignorant of the grace that God has extended toward him. You, you see that in verse two, Jonah says, I knew, I knew that you were a God who was compassionate. And Jonah's resentful of that. Now, if Jonah's gonna bring up the compassion of God, he should probably not be resentful of it. He should probably be grateful because what character in this story has received more compassion than anybody else? Jonah, when you see yourself as a recipient of great grace, then God's compassion, listen, becomes his most precious attribute to you. And when God's compassion becomes his most precious attribute to you, then you become compassionate by nature to others. When you're generous, it's because you understand the beauty of God's grace. If you're not forgiving with your spouse or those around you, then you probably don't understand grace. Those people who are recipients of great grace become dispensers of great grace. Honestly, Jonah probably saw his sin and Nineveh's sin in two different categories. I mean, he was like, oh, the Nineveh, the Ninevite, they're adulterers, they're cruel. I'm not a bad sinner like them. Let me ask you this, what had Jonah done? Jonah had looked into the face of God and said, no. Each of you in this room have looked at God at some point in your life. You said, no, God, I am not doing that. And that is blasphemy of the highest order. Jonah doesn't understand that. You and I don't understand that, which is why we don't understand how much grace God has given us. Write this down. A spirit of unforgiveness and a lack of generosity is the indication you are out of touch with the grace of God in your own life. So that's Jonah's disease, idolatry and ignorance. By the way, and all of this after, after he has consented to do God's will, right? I mean, by Jonah 4, Jonah's no longer directly defiant of God, is he? He's doing exactly what God wants. He's not even doing part of what God wants. He's doing all of what God wants. That is the picture of most religious people. Religious people are like, well, I don't want to go to hell and I don't want to be in the belly of a whale, so I'll do what God wants. But that doesn't mean that you come to delight in God or become forgiving like God. Delighting in God, becoming loving like God, those things can only happen in you by a deep and profound experience of grace. That's why the Messianic reading of Jonah is so important because in the Messianic reading, you begin to see that Jesus is the one who suffered all the consequences for your disobedience. And when you begin to see that, that should produce love and generosity in your heart. God is not just after obedience, church. Listen, he's after a whole new kind of obedience, the obedience that grows from the passions of the heart. All right, there's more. Verse five. Verse five. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Man, he is hoping. He's like, I hope that repentance wears off. I hope that God forgets about it. I hope they take God off again. There would have been nothing that Jonah would have loved more than to see a lightning bolt come out of heaven and just obliterate the city of Nineveh. All right, nothing would have made him feel better. You got somebody in your life like that? Verse six. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the plant came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant. Not just killed the plant, attacked it so that it withered. Verse eight, when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. Not just an east wind, a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the bald head of Jonah so that he was faint. Doesn't say bald in Hebrew, but I'm pretty sure Jonah was bald. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, 
do you well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Now, if I were Jonah's counselor, and Jonah was telling me this story, and he got to this point about, you know, and God said to me, do you do well to be angry? And I said, yeah, I do well to be angry for the plant, angry enough to die. At that point, I would have been tempted to laugh. And then I would have looked at Jonah and seen that he is not laughing. And then I'd wipe the smile off my face and I'd say, wow, sounds like that plan was really important to you, Jonah. I'm just going to nod my head. This is the second time that God has asked Jonah if he has a right to be angry. The first time was in verse four and Jonah had no response. This time he explodes back to God. You're daggum right I'm angry. And I got a right to be angry. I am justified in my anger. Verse 10, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also some cows? The word of God, my friend, the word of God. God says, Jonah, you're all tore up about a plant, a plant, a plant that came into being in a night and perished in a night. I mean, that's a pretty impressive plant. I'm not going to lie to you. Turbo plant. It was like, you didn't work for it. It's temporary. It's passing. 120,000 people in the city don't know the right hand from their left. By the way, most scholars say that's not a reference to people who are ambidextrous. That means that they're children. Don't know the right hand from the left. 120,000 kids. It's like, Jonah, how could you look at such a massive destruction of life of sinful people? Yes, but people, Jonah, just like you, and even children who are as precious to me as your children, Jonah, are to you. How could you look at that with no emotion, Jonah? And yeah, I think the last line is thrown in there for a little sardonic kind of comic relief. But I also, by the way, just real quick, this is a little off topic, but that last line, also much cattle, is in there for another reason. You don't know what it is? All through the Old Testament, there is a promise that God is not just redeeming the human race. He's also redeeming the whole world, which includes all creation. Remember I told you last week that they made the cows, you know, go without food, and the effect of that would be to moo. You know, so you got all these cows all over the, you know, the city mooing, creating a sense of mourning. Romans chapter 8 says all of creation is groaning, awaiting the redemption of the sons of God. So he's showing that, yeah, hey, Jonah, it's not just even, it's about the people, yes, but it's also the whole world cries out for redemption, and you resent it. So how does Jonah end? What is Jonah's response? Look at your Bible. What's the next verse say? There is no next verse. <laughs> That's right. That's it. That's the end. The Dukes of Hazard ending. Bo and Luke Duke in midair. You just don't know where they're going to land. It's a cliffhanger. It ends with a question because the book is a question for religious people like Jonah. And that question is, do you care? Do you care more for perishing people than you do for your stuff? Stuff that is temporary, like the plant that comes up, goes away, fades away as quickly as you obtained it, and on the scale of eternity is actually pretty meaningless. That's the question of the book of Jonah. It's a question for you. What do you care the most about? What are you most upset about right now? The tears that you shed last year. Go back and think about the last year. The tears that you shed over the course of a year. What were they about? How much grief does the fate of lost people bring to you? Romans chapter 9, Paul says, when he thinks about the fate of people apart from God, he says, literally, I am in anguish every day. What did you cry about last year? Have you ever been in anguish over lost people? Have you ever shed a tear over somebody who is lost? Yeah.